We are the guys that ease the use of broadcast hardware for people making live video. That's our mission. And we do it by creating universal broadcast controllers. So if you look at our lineup, we have many different form factors. Anything from desktop consoles like this one to handheld remotes and rack units and so forth. Now, generally, these controllers are intelligent or they are aware of the devices they are controlling. They uh, will implement a protocol of a given router or a given camera and so forth. And you see the background behind me illustrates some of that because the support for these devices are installed on the controller like you install an app on your smartphone. So um, it's a little piece of software, a driver, call it whatever you want. We call it device cores. And these will support the hardware externally. They don't know that we have a hardware panel connecting to it. It could be anything typically. Now, sometimes people want it the reverse way. They want our panels to be dumb. Essentially that our panels have a protocol that they can interface with. And that's what this video is about. So if you want to integrate your product, your broadcast device, your uh, software, broadcast software with our hardware panels, we have a protocol and API. And this video will take a look at how to get started with that, what the, the essential bits and pieces of this protocol is. So uh, let me just introduce what I have here. Uh, we have an XC6, which is a uh, desktop console panel with RGB broadcast buttons and displays. And then on my laptop, um, I have a, um, a terminal window running uh, open uh, with a Perl, uh, sorry, not Perl, uh, Python script running, which acts as a server. So here we have the XC6 panel. And you see the test script running on my laptop in the terminal window. You see messages popping up in the, um, in the terminal, which uh, essentially um, reflects the communication happening to the panel. So currently, I'm just running a script called, let me see, it's called um, color and display test. So what it does is it's just flooding the display with uh, updated colors for the buttons and updated content for the displays as quick as it can almost. And um, obviously that demonstrates the whole point. You can do all these things. You can update the, the displays with text or plain graphics. You can set any uh, button color you want. You can also, and that's only obvious if I press a button, you can see in the terminal window that we get a message indicating that I pressed the button. Okay, so that's kind of the, uh, the, the full um, demonstration of what we can do with a blinky panel and um, should give you an idea that basically any kind of control you want is possible. So to just break it down into the basics, we can send you button presses, we can send you encoder pulses, we can send you analog values from a, a T-bar handle or knob or uh, we can send you speed values from a joystick. This is all going from the panel to the server, which is the software or device you have. Now, in the other direction, from the server, we can send uh, information about whether or not the button should be off, dimmed, or, or highlighted, and which color it has, including what to show in the display in terms of either just line of, of text or graphics. That's the basics. And now we're gonna take a look at how that works. So uh, basically diving into the protocol. Now, um, if first we take a look at where this information is found, then uh, we should turn our eyes to the uh, Unisgate's TCP client documentation. So as I said, uh, the panel works as a client and um, the particular device core installed on the panel is called Unisgate's TCP client because that's the protocol um, that we implement in a generic way, Unisketch is the, the name of the protocol. And um, that's what we will see documented in, in this uh, manual. In the beginning of the manual, there are some uh, basics which we'll just ignore for now. Uh, but then in the whole section about API for DOM panels, you will find information about how, uh, first of all, which port we connect to, that's 9923. Then a little bit about the handshaking that has to go on, and then the inbound and the outbound TCP commands. Okay, so that's all found uh, in this document. Now, um, to get you started quickly, uh, we provided some Python scripts, which you can run on um, a laptop, um, I guess Windows, Mac, Linux, whatever. 
so you can get quickly started when you have a panel in your hand. And uh, that's where I want to turn our eyes to now. So um, the first thing we want to try is uh, make a really simple example where we are rotating colors. And um, if we go to this script called trigger response, we'll see um, if I just start it up in the terminal here. Trigger response like this. Okay, so maybe let's just quickly take a look at what happened here. So when I started the script, it sets itself up as a server and after a while the panel will connect to, um, to the server when it realizes because the panel continuously tries to connect to uh, the server it has been instructed to. Um, and then it's, um, when it's connected, it will send a list command. The list command is essentially uh, the panel asking you to dump uh, state information. And the most uh, important thing to do is to return the command active panel equal one. So uh, now the client knows that the server is there and it's ready to rock. So um, right after that, the client sends you RDY, that means ready. And um, we saw it before when we ran the, the color test because uh, when we are flooding the panel with commands, at some point the panel will tell you, please stop, I'm busy. Uh, if you don't stop, then you'll have a lot of commands piling up in somewhere in the TCP uh, system. And uh, it means whenever you uh, basically stop the server, the panel will just continue processing commands that are in queue. So you want to observe the busy um, response from the panel so you don't flood it with information. I think that mostly applies when you do uh, something like a burn-in test where you're just flooded with messages. So another thing uh, we see is a map command coming from the panel to the server and that offers us information about um, which numbers are used to identify the various hardware components. So a hard hardware component would be a button, it can also be a display, it can be a, a rotary encoder on other panels than this one and so forth. So that's the, all the initial information that we get sent. And now when we return to, um, to looking at the um, terminal window here, we see uh, there's a lot of, um, of periodic uh, pings coming from the panel. So that's uh, key value information. Every three seconds, it will send you a ping and you should respond by essentially just something. But if you, you can send something like ACK, in return to the to the panel and it will know that you are still there and not disconnected so um, it's a good way to know the server is alive and aware that the panel is connected and so forth otherwise it will disconnect and try to reconnect also once in a while every one minute you will see a list command which is the client asking you to update status information um, I think the manual describes that you can um, respond to this in any way you want depending on on how severe you consider that message because um, the list command um, is in a way not necessary since state information is supposed to be exchanged uh, continuously along the way but it's more like a way to say okay just make sure that you dump everything you know about yourself to me that I should know about uh, just in case you forgot to send something continuously um, that's the kind of message we are talking about, that it's, it's um, asking you to dump the state. Yeah, so that's kind of the basic handshaking going on. And uh, in this simple example that I set up now, uh, what we did was um, uh, we, we have a script that whenever I press any of these buttons, you see how the, the key responds by an on color, then a dimmed color, and, and it circles uh, or rotates the colors as well. So that's basically what this uh, script does. Okay, so it detects a key press, then it highlights the button, I release the key, and it dims the button, and every time I'm rotating color. So let's see how, how um, that's implemented. Well, first of all, if we look at um, the, the stuff being sent forth and back, then um, it's, um, you can see here the panel, the client, which is on this IP address, 
it sends hwc number three down and then a new line character. So that's what happens when I press a button. And then in return, you as a server, or this script as a server will send back hvc number three equals 36. 36 is a combination of uh, bit number six or bit number five if we start at zero. So that's basically 32 plus the value four and the value four means the button is on. Then a new line and then we also send HVC, hwc and lowercase c number three that's for color use color 129. That's also a combination of uh, the, the seventh bit, uh, which indicates that we are exposing an externally set color. The default color is white, as you can see, but whenever we press these buttons, we want to set a color from the server. And um, so, and that's, in, in this case, it's, it's color number one, because it's a combination of the uh, seventh bit and um, then um, the number one represented by the i think remaining five or six bits see all that information is in the manual so let's just divert attention to the manual first of all you see um if you look at inbound tcp commands what comes from the server to the client we see that um the most basic command you can send is essentially should this, the button be on off or dimmed and as i said the 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 number four uh, means it's on while um and that's what we didn't see, because whenever I release the button, like here you see, HVC3 is up. And then it returns HWC number 3 equals 5. And 5 means dimmed. So you see it's, it's uh, going forth and back between the value 4 and 5. And I also put a line here in the document that describes how um, uh, the, the most typical values you'll use is basically zero to turn it off and then on and uh, um, 36 and five for on and dimmed. So we look at the color also, then you can see this command, which was the one we saw right here dictating the particular color that um, the button should have uh, is documented right here and how uh, the various bits d uh, decide certain things. And then we also have a list of colors um, so you can choose colors by index that's what i do right here and i tell you why because if you just took the 64 different rgb combinations that's available you have two bits per per color rg and b then you would obtain colors that cannot be distinguished from each other so we went through the hard work to weed out the what is it something like 47 colors which are just overlapping and then bringing you uh, the 17 colors. Well, okay, I see default and off is included. So it's more like 15 colors. We have 15 colors that are distinct from one another visually, and we suggest that you use those, but you can use RGB if you want. Uh, that's a possibility too. So that's basically what goes on forth and back. Very simple when I press these buttons. Now, uh, let's just take a look at the Python script. So the Python script is here and it's available for download. It's in the manual. So uh, you can go and uh, fetch it. You see how we basically implement uh, the list uh, response to, to the list command, a response to the basic command, to the ready, to the ping and so forth. Uh, then I also use the incoming map information uh, to inform myself about, uh, no, actually what I do right here is whenever I get a map command, I respond back to the server by telling the server highlight this button. So that's what I do initially when I get a map command. Now then I have, um, I detect for the down press and the up press. And um, then you see it's in here how I take um, the color of the button, I in uh, increment it, and then I send back the new color. And um, that's basically what the script does. So I suggest if you want to get started with these panels, then uh, running the trigger response is probably the quickest way to get uh, some kind of feeling that you have a communication going with the panel. So the next thing we could do is to uh, rotate graphics. So graphics is um, still quite easy, depending on whether you want to send just text strings or if you want to send uh, bitmap graphics to the panel. But um, the script that we need to take a look at is called 
let's see, trigger, trigger cycle display. So in this case, um, and we can take a look at the code, which is right here. You see in the top of the script, in the code, <coughs> we have uh, some text strings and image strings. So uh, again, if we look in the manual, we'll see a description of how to do these things. Uh, the command for sending text is called HWC T and then uh, the number of the component and um, the text that you send back to the panel is what I call a tokenized string. So it means that the string has a certain format where we use a vertical pipe to separate parameters. And um, that will, that's, that's because um, you could of course just send plain text, but there are certain features in, involved that might be handy for you. For instance, if you want to show, uh, and you can see this, uh, that there's a whole uh, overview here, which is really nice and um, worth studying. So um, in this overview, you see that by just sending a string of text, you can get pretty complex layouts for your display, which can be really handy if what you just want to do is to present a floating point value and then have a nice title. Then you can send this instead of uh, generating graphics on the server and sending that, which by the way also takes up more bandwidth. So, um, and, th and that's one way of generating graphics. So you, you see in this overview, many different uh, forms of uh, graphics that you can produce in this way, um, represented by examples, and also uh, documented, of course, if you um, look further up, you have a documentation of what each element in the tokenized string means. And the, the script over here will provide you a great way to, uh, to experiment because you can just add new strings to the array and then uh, play around with the values to see uh, how it works. So the other way we can do this would be to actually send images. So if we um, go forward, then we see another command uh, with a G and um, it will send a bitmap graphic, a monochrome graphic in, um, uh, uh, 64 times 32 pixels uh, dimensions and uh, it has to be sent in three separate commands because we have a buffer size that we want to respect which means that we break it off uh, up in, in in three lines. In the Python script you see those three lines represented in these arrays so uh, and how do I get these arrays anyway? Now uh, I do that by using our online conversion tool. So again in the manual there's a nice little link that will bring you over to this image conversion tool where you can upload almost any image and it will be taken down to the right dimensions. It has to be 64 by 32 and um, uh, maybe we could try this. So um, we'll take this one and then submit it and now you can see this is um, now um, the image is, is red. We get information about which dimensions it had and then essentially uh, in the bottom, we see also three lines that would be the lines that we can send to the Unisketch TCP client um, where you must take care that this, uh, the curly braces needs to be substituted with the uh, hardware interface component number that we use in the exchange of information here, forth and back. Um, those three lines would be very easy to copy paste directly into the Python script. Now let's take a look at what happens when we run this Python, Python script. Whoa, okay, I already did it. Now, uh, the initial thing is exactly the same. You see um, the list, the active panel, the, the map information going uh, from the panel to the server and now ping commands uh, floating in. So let's take a look at uh, the panel. When I press the buttons, you can see um, it's uh, sending graphics over to the displays. And now I, I just happen to organize it with some fun graphics here. And because it looks so cool, I'm just gonna complete my... No! I forgot to press that button. Okay, hey, that still works. Okay, and there we have some graphics and icons and so forth. Now, um, after going through all the bitmap graphics that I just put on the panel, it's cycling through all the text examples and if I just continuously push any button or any number of buttons, you can see these graphics are, are rotating. Okay, so here we have a lot of information flowing through also the, um, um, the terminal window. 
And uh, maybe we should take a look at, at some of that. So, okay, if I press this button, you can see, and I release it again. Let's see what happens right there in this transaction. We see the client has sent information that this button was down. And then I return three lines from the server to the panel, which is essentially the graphic that was then painted on the display. On a release of the trigger, nothing seems to happen. I just accept it and don't act on it in any way. Now, um, if we just forward quickly to when we see text messages in the display, and I think we are there about now. There you see, when I press this button down, it just sent this uh, line, which just showed the integer value. And in fact, those examples that you see in this script is exac exactly the examples that comes from the um, documentation. Oh, <clears throat> if I go to the section about text graphics, text-based graphics, you see that was the integer value that if I press once more, you get the other value, the uh, Minus nine 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 nine. All right, so I think we also got through with the graphics now. Uh, we have seen text painted and graphics painted, and we have to, um, looked at handshaking. Um, maybe the last thing that I want to go through now is so how do we set the panel up with an IP address that um, is uh, the known server on the network? So. Um, and that also exposes another thing. It works over IP. So it's uh, IP based, which is a, a great advantage since you are, are nicely free of cable length and all kinds of things. You can multiple panels connected to your server and it can also communicate with many different things. But I'll get back to that in another video. So um, if, if we are to take a look at how to configure the panel to direct its attention to a particular server, then we go to the Skaho firmware application which is uh, connected with a USB cable to the panel. And when it is connected so, you can uh, do two things. First, you could always open configuration um, for the panel, which is an online configuration you see right here, which is generally the suggested way to, uh, to do it. And uh, in the bottom of this page, you see the IP address of the Unisketch TCP client is listed right there. This is the one address it's communicating to. Now, um, that's like the mother of all configuration. That's what happens on our website. And to then get this, in, um, doc uh, sorry, this configuration onto your panel, you need to uh, check for updates, which will download a new firmware put on the panel. So it's, it's actually able to do so much more because you can set up configuration for each button and all such intelligent stuff that you don't want because you just want a dumb panel. And that's what we are talking about right now. So um, what you can also do is to disregard the online um, online configuration tool, just open the serial monitor and press the config button. So if you do that, uh, bring the device into configuration mode, something you can also do by pressing the configuration button on the back, then um, you will be able to set the IP address um, of the panel. So now we are booting the, the controller in a configuration mode. And when it's in configuration mode, you can access it on its IP address, which is this one. And I'll just copy it over in my web browser. And there you go. So now this is the local web server on the panel that I can now access. And it looks very much like the online configuration tool. In fact, large portions of it is shared between them so you see in the bottom of the page, you can set the IP address of your dump panel. And that's not too unintelligent, is it? So this is where you would set up um, the IP address of the server you want to communicate to. I think that concludes this video that introduces you to get started programming up against your Skahoy dump panel in a fairly intelligent way.